Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Prepare Your Organization for the Coronavirus Disease Outbreak. Uh, I just want to start out and thank everyone for coming in. I do apologize for the slight delay. We've had a tremendous response to this webinar, and uh, we were trying to drag our feet a little bit to allow more people to get in. And now I'd like to introduce ESA founder and president Jim Digby for a few brief comments, and we'll get rolling. Uh, hi, Jacob. Thank you very much for the introduction, and hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I know that there are a multitude of voices out there um, addressing this issue, and we are adding to that cacophony now. Uh, I think, you know, firstly, before we get rolling, I, hello to all our friends in Nashville and Middle Tennessee, and uh, we're with you in spirit, if, not, if nothing else, and are available to try to raise, raise our help if we can. Um, with respect to uh, the coronavirus, I, I think for me, it's a three or three or four more fold issue. Firstly, obviously, we're we're worried about the disease itself and what it means. And um, you know, quite quite uh, comically, I'm sure some of you are thinking, "Well, I'll just go wash my hands and that'll be that." Well, that's good, but there is the potential that this disease could cripple our industry for some period of time if for no other reason than perception alone. And it's that reason why we wanted to have this uh, webinar to discuss it. Um, there is already uh, several vendors are uh, closing off uh, their funding for things. They are securing their, um, their accounts to ensure that they can keep their, their teams afloat through what might be a very dark period. Hopefully that won't last very long. Um, and the nature of our work being gig to gig and check to check presents some problems for cancellations. There are a number of conferences that have already canceled. Uh, obviously, uh, the ancillary industries like airlines and restaurants and everything and hotels will suffer as well. Um, and as I said, the biggest the biggest issue is perception. Uh, you know, the World Health Organization has has released their key planning recommendations for mass gatherings, uh, not unlike the flu. Um, <clears throat> the CDC is releasing information that is also viable and obviously necessary. We are not going to overrule anything that's being said out there already by these other two organizations, but ours is a unique business that relies on mass gatherings to, um, to exist. Uh, and it's therefore the reason why we brought you Dr. Weiss and the hope that we can perhaps answer some questions, look forward to what may be happening tomorrow and in the near term and what may be happening in the longer term and, and how we can better prepare for that. So with that, I'd like to thank both Jacob and Dr. Weiss for being a part of this with us. Uh, and Dr. Weiss, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jim and, and Jacob. And uh, I'll actually thank you to the Event Safety Alliance for the opportunity to present today. Um, we've been working very closely with our clients to create customized plans and solutions for coronavirus outbreak, and I'm really excited today to present um, this update and, and some of the best practices that we've learned um, over this number of months um, to the close to 2,000 folks that, from the community that I love and have worked with for many years that have come on to this, uh, this webinar. So uh, once again, really thank you very much. Um, just from a technology standpoint, we're noticing on the computer that there are three windows still open on the bottom of the screen that's covering up the, the bottom third. Um, if that can be adjusted, that'd be great. Otherwise, I may have to read some of the, the slide bottoms that will be, uh, will be missing. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that as we go along. And, and I apologize for those of you that can't see the, the bottom um, quarter of the slide, looks like. Um, so, Jake, if you can work on that, that'd be great. Um, before I start, um, for folks who may be listening to this as a recording, uh, the status of the disease is really changing on a daily or sometimes even hourly basis. So uh, all the information I'll be presenting to you today is current as of today, Wednesday, March 4th, 2020. So we're going to spend some time together now talking about a number of items. The first thing, and you can see now, let's see, the, the, the slide change? There we go. Ah, but the, the screens are blocked, so I'll just read you. The, uh, under the agenda, 
um, today. We're going to be covering um, the current threat level of the COVID-19 disease. What are the top eight things that you should be addressing right now? And then we're going to talk a little bit about personal and family preparedness. And then I want to end up with uh, last steps. So let's jump right into this. And then at the, at the very end, we will address some of the questions um, that you might have that you've uh, submitted via the web interface. So you've all actually had coronavirus. I know everyone's very afraid of it, and it's this brand new thing that we're all worried about. But coronavirus is actually a very large family of viruses that are common in many different mammalian species, such as camels and cats and bats and, and, um, and cattle, right? It causes the common cold, which you've all gotten. Now, with this particular virus, we think that it came from bats. It's about 96% similar to the bat strain of coronavirus, but it did actually need an intermediate host in order to uh, start infecting human beings. Now, there are seven actual varieties of coronavirus that affect humans. The first four on these slides, the two alpha types and the two beta types on the top of the screen, those are the types of coronaviruses that circulate every single year. And you have already had these during your lifetime. They cause a stuffy nose, a little bit of upper respiratory infection. It's the normal kind of cold that you get pretty much every single winter. And then we've had three coronaviruses that have mutated that have caused more severe disease. So the original SARS virus in 2002, um, that was an illness that, that migrated from animals to humans. It affected about 37 different countries. There was a little over 8,000 cases reported and about 774 or five deaths, which made it about a 9.5% mortality rate. Right. Then in 2012, and actually continuing, although you're not hearing a lot about it, was the Mediterranean uh, MERS um, respiratory syndrome, which was caused by the MERS coronavirus in 2012. It affected 26 countries, about uh, 24, actually 2,495 cases, 858 deaths, about a 34 percent mortality rate. So those were two diseases that were very scary with high mortality rates. However, they didn't spread very far. They weren't easily transmissible. Then we have the current virus. Now, the name of the virus is actually called SARS-CoV-2. So Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Now, the SARS-CoV-2 virus causes coronavirus disease or COVID. So there's been lots of people that are confused about what's the virus and what's the disease. Just so you understand, the virus is SARS-CoV-2 and the disease, which is COVID for CO for corona, VI for virus, and D for disease. So COVID um, 2019 is actually a disease. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the mortality rate of, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, but just for comparison's sake, influenza causes usually about 0.1 to 0.5% mortality each year. Um, the, pan the great Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 had about a 2% mortality. And the current virus is, is tending. It originally looked like it was about 3.5% three mortality. Now it's gone down to what people think is about 2%. And we think it's actually going to be lower than that. Uh, once we do more testing, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So let's look back a little bit on the coronavirus and where it came from. If we take a look back um, in December of 2019, just a few months ago, there was a very astute physician in China who subsequently has died from this, who noticed that there was a cluster of sick patients with pneumonia and respiratory illness in the Wuhan in the city of Wuhan in China, in the Hubei province, in their um, live animal and seafood market, 
right? Most of the patients were in that marketplace. They had, that's where we think the virus actually started spreading and it caused a big cluster of virus back in 2018, uh, 2019, December. A few weeks later, in January, many people started not having a link to that animal market and it became very apparent that there was person to person spread and that was actually confirmed. Now, I talked about the fact that it came, 96% of the generic material are similar to bat coronavirus. But in order for it to spread to humans, it needed a, a animal intermediary. And they think, although there's not, they're not clear yet exactly, that this creature on the right side of your screen, which is called a pangolin, not a penguin, which is what I've heard some people talk about. Not a penguin, but a pangolin, which is a scale-covered anteater, may have been the intermediary host where it actually mutated that second time and became able to spread from person to person. So what do we actually know about the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Let's take a look at what's going on with it. The incubation period is up to 14 days. Now it's usually between five and seven days, but the reason that people are held in quarantine for up to two weeks, 14 days, is because the virus can take that long to actually start showing symptoms. And the virus we found spreads between people that are in close proximity, and we'll talk about social distancing a little bit later, but about six feet, is the distance that your respiratory droplets spread when a sick person coughs or sneezes. It also gets picked up when you touch a contaminated surface and then you touch your face. That lovely picture on the screen right now is actually one of the people in my office and even though we're really into this and study this disease and talk about it every day, I still caught her touching her eye and her face. Um, in fact, there's been a study in college students that was done a, a number of years ago that showed on average, they touch their faces 23 times an hour. So it's really subconscious, you're not thinking about it, but you're rubbing your face, you're touching your face, which is why contact surface cleaning um, and, and preventing direct spread through touching something into your eyes or mouth or nose is really important. You tend to spread the virus when you're the most sick. There have been some cases and some reports of asymptomatic spread, but so far, the vast majority of it is actually spread when you're the most sick. Now, one of the things that makes this such a challenge for public health is that for every one person that gets the disease, they spread it to a little over two people on average. Right, that's the R0 that you see on the bottom of your screen there. R0 is the spreadability factor. And this virus is a one person spreads it to a little over two people. That makes it really easily contagious and spreadable. And that's why you see it spreading around the world. Now, the mortality is calculated if you take the number of cases and divide it, the number of deaths and divide it by the number of cases, it comes out to 3.4%, but most experts now think that it's 2%, and it's probably going to end up being lower than that, because right now we don't know all the number of cases that have been so mild that the, nobody paid attention to it, right? When you get a normal coronavirus winter cold, and you have a stuffy nose, um, you basically go to the store, you buy some over-the-counter items, and then you go about your life. You don't usually run to the hospital or run to the doctor. So we don't know the actual number of cases, um, which is why we think the mortality rate's gonna actually be a little bit lower. But just remember, it's still 10 times higher than the flu um, is, and it's, it's the same level right now as that big Spanish flu in 1918. So it is something that's really significant from a public health perspective, and something that we do need to pay attention to. If you take a look at the current statistics from this morning, it's in um, over, somewhere between 70 and 80 countries right now. It's on all the continents, and then you can take a look at the different numbers. You've heard a lot about South Korea. You've heard a lot about Iran and Italy. Um, and then you can see the United States were now up to 128 cases as of this morning. The pictures on your the right side of your screen are interesting ones from uh, some colleagues and friends of mine in China. You can see that some of the extreme measures that they took 
for public health protection and social distancing, like marking out elevators and only allowing a certain number of people, one person to stand in each one of those boxes in the elevator. Or you can see on the bottom, a traffic stop with a drone carrying a sign that said stop and they did thermal imaging of people and they checked their temperatures. And if you had a temperature and you were, and you were in your car you were, or a truck, you were dragged out of the truck and sent to quarantine. So I'm not sure that we could actually achieve um, those type of public health interventions here in the United States um, or in Canada, for those of you that are up in Canada, I'm not sure we could do that. Um, but uh, those are kind of the measures that, that China used fairly effectively. And I just want to uh, mentioned that from the uh, early on here in this talk that China was was particularly effective in delaying the spread of this virus around the world. They used a tremendous amount of resources to combat a brand new virus, um, and they were fairly effective. Now they weren't able to stop it because the virus spreads, as I mentioned, very easily. But they were they did a fairly good job initially delaying the spread of the virus and giving us and the rest of the world more time to actually get ready. Next slide shows the deaths. Um, you can take a look at the deaths um, around the world. The vast majority are still in China, um, with Iran being right after China, then Italy, South Korea, and then here in the United States. And unfortunately, in the US, those deaths are all in that nursing home in Washington, which is a, a very sad uh, case going on there. Okay, for those of you that haven't yet tuned into the Johns Hopkins site, um, Johns Hopkins is being particularly great about tracking all the different cases. This is a screenshot of the of the site from this morning at 8.30. Um, they update it multiple times during the day. If you wanna follow exactly the real counts of the disease, you can actually go on the Johns Hopkins site um, and um, and I can send you the link if you drop me an email um, or just Google Johns Hopkins coronavirus and they'll bring it up for you. Um, you can then take a look at what's going on if you want to follow it moment to moment. But it's a great, uh, a great place to follow the latest in what's going on with the total number of cases, the total number of recovered and, and the deaths. One of the interesting things on the right side of your screen is actually the orange line. You can see that the number of cases in China have actually started slowing down. It's got, we, we were still seeing a big upslope up until pretty recently when the number of new cases has started slowing down. So what's going on around the world, right? The virus has pretty much already met the definition of a pandemic, right? It has number one, the number one criteria, it causes illness resulting in death, um, which can result in death. Number two, it has sustained person to person spread. And then number three, it's worldwide spread. It's in every continent. Um, this slide's a little bit old from yesterday. It's now in over 70 countries, but the WHO, the World Health Organization is not yet declared a pandemic. I think it's because they don't want to incite any more concern or panic than what's already happened, but um, it's pretty much met the definition of a pandemic already. There's no vaccine, there's no treatment medications for it yet. Um, I know you've all heard a lot of talk about vaccines. It really takes about a year to develop a vaccine. So um, it, in spite of the fact that various governments are talking about how we're, they're working very vigorously on developing a vaccine, it will take generally about a year to year and a half to get a safe vaccine out there. Treatment medications are being worked on currently. There's a couple of promising candidates out there, so we'll see when those become um, out into the public for use. Now, if you take a look what's going on around the world and I know that Jim mentioned some of the things being canceled, lots of stuff going on around the world. It's a slide, depending on your display size, maybe a little difficult. I tried to pull to read. I pulled lots of big headlines off the uh, off the internet. But you can see that you know the the Louvre Museum in Paris was closed for a bit. Uh, uh, lots of corporations are preventing non-essential air travel, although uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. I think the the days of of containing this by limiting non-essential travel domestically is probably over. Um, there's been lots of other events that have been canceled or postponed. Um, one of the interesting things here in New York 
that we're very excited about is that coronavirus has forced the New York City subway system to clean every single one of the trains and all 472 stations and over 2,000 buses. So on behalf of New Yorkers, we're all very excited about the side effects of the coronavirus here in New York because the stations all smell wonderful now and they're all very clean. Um, but uh, there's extreme things going on around the country. I'm not sure that cleaning every single train station in New York and all 2,000 subway cars was actually necessary. Um, or was gonna do anything significant because the second someone coughs on one of those handrails, it'll be contaminated again. But um, there was a good side effect that we noticed. Th that happened last night here in New York. And then this morning it was announced that the LA Marathon is moving forward um, despite coronavirus. So lots of variability on what's going on around the country because this is clearly a, a an evolving situation. What's going on in the US? If we take a look at that, This community spread in most places is almost definite, right? We've had cases, if you take a look on the slide, you can see all the different states where we've had cases already. Lots of them are not associated. Some of them are still associated with, with uh, people that have traveled to areas with high disease, but there's lots of folks that are around the country that are not associated with that. I would suspect in the Pacific Northwest, once we start doing lots more testing, um, that we will see community spread. The reason we haven't been able to tell what's going on recently is because up until this past weekend, there was a significant problem here in the United States with the test kits that were developed by the Centers for Disease Control. They have three components. One of the three components was not valid in some of the testing procedures, um, so the testing was really limited. That problem has been fixed. There's gonna be thousands or hundreds of thousands of more test kits made available over the coming weeks. There, the criteria for testing will be relaxed and we'll start to see many more reported cases, which will just reflect accurately the fact that there's community spread. And in general, although still, the risk for the average American is still considered fairly low because right now, and this is important to keep in context, right? So right now, vast majority of folks that get this virus have a runny nose and a cold and they're over it and they're fine and they go about their business in a few days, right? So of, of the people that catch the virus, about 80% of them do just fine. About 20% of them require some more advanced medical care up to and including hospitalization. Um, and 2% of them or less will die of this disease. Now, the problem for public health is the fact that up to 20% may require some type of medical support up to and including hospitalization. So if you take a big population of people that all of a sudden requires hospital beds in the middle of the winter where we already have flu season, that creates a problem for public health. So lots of our clients are continually asking What's the future going to look like? How do I plan for events that are happening a month, two months, five months next fall? So I don't have a crystal ball for you, but what I can tell you is a couple of things. First, we don't know how this virus is going to behave because it's a brand new virus and none of us have immunity to it yet. So it's a little bit different than any of the other viruses that circulate. But based on, and this is a hypothesis, so based on the, fact, the way other coronaviruses and other seasonal viruses act, there's a chance that this will calm itself down when the weather starts getting warmer. Now, again, we don't know if this virus is gonna follow the same pattern as other similar types of viruses. So a lot those viruses will calm themselves down when the weather warms up, and then they'll come back in the fall. Um, the, the, the difficult problem with this particular virus is that because nobody has any immunity, we don't know if this virus is just gonna continue spreading throughout our society, even in the warmer weather days. So the future is really, 
difficult to predict right now. Um, until we learn more about what this virus is doing and what its genetic characteristics are. So the future is you have to stay tuned and you need to keep it. We'll keep an eye with you on what's going on with the spread of this virus and are we seeing it change its behavior as the weather starts to warm up and we get into the, the late spring and, and summer months. So having said that, what are the eight things that you should be doing right now? And I want to spend the next uh, few moments talking with you about what we've learned from working with our clients on both pandemic plans from back back when we were worried about bird flu span, uh, you know, uh, coming around the world to what we learned working with clients on the coronavirus. So number one is develop a business continuity infectious disease plan. Take your business continuity plan and look at it through the lens of infectious diseases, right? It's a little bit different, right? Because right now there's a global infectious disease crisis that's spreading. But how your community responds is actually a very local phenomenon. We like to say that all infectious disease responses are local because it has to do with what does your local health official want to do about mass gatherings, for example. So what will they say to you? Your, whether you can run an event or not will be determined by the local county or city health department. There'll be CDC guidance uh, on what's supposed to happen and what they recommend, but it's really important to remember that the, whether your events go or don't go and how the community responds it really will be controlled by the local public health department. So it's time, it's the time to do nothing is actually over. So I don't know if you can see, there's a big cross across that post that says do nothing on your slide there. The time now is if you have an old pandemic preparedness plan, it's time to brush that plan off and take a look at it. If you don't have any pandemic plans, it's time to work with somebody to develop a pandemic business continuity plan while we still have time, right? So there are some basic assumptions that you should be making when you start developing your plans. One I just spoke about, that your events will be controlled by the local public health department. And as, as Jim mentioned, excuse me, <clears throat> as Jim mentioned, the CDC has put out some general guidance for large events, and I'll, I'll show you that in a few moments. But it's time to make sure that you have a very well-established relationship with key community partners, such as your public health officers, your Office of Emergency Management, and your mayor's office. And then also make sure if you don't own and operate your own venue that you actually are talking to your venue operators. This is the, the notice that came out from New York City Department of Health just yesterday, um, which their guidance right now is the New York City Department of Health does not currently recommend avoiding or canceling any public gatherings, meetings, or events. But what you need to make sure is that that caveat at the top, which says this is a rapidly changing situation. Um, because everyone realizes that this guidance may actually change as we start to see more and more community spread. Here is the um, example of what's come out from the CDC. Just came out a day or day and a half ago. Um, get your mass gatherings or large community events ready for coronavirus. It has some interesting points in it, most of which I'll cover during my talk here. Um, but if you just Google uh, CDC coronavirus mass gatherings, um, you could certainly get to the same page here. Um, and it gives you a number of really interesting points uh, that you should be planning for when you're talking about special events. So plan essentials, when you're thinking about developing a plan, and if you were to take a look at one of the plans that we've written with, with our clients, you'll see that there are three phases to a good plan, right? There's the pre-outbreak preparation, where you do a lot of planning and training. Then there's the, the disease is present, but it's not local in your specific community, 
which that time is kind of running out. We'll see again what happens over the summertime. But right now, I think we're going to start seeing spread around really around North America, most of the communities. But that's the time to do a threat assessment. And then actually you activate your plan when the threat is actually in your community. And then the last bit is actually what do you do after the threat is passed, uh, assuming that this virus then passes on or mutates or does something to to lower its uh, infectivity rate um, or it becomes just a common virus that spreads every year. Um, what do you do to look at your plans and make sure you can revise them and improve them, right? So good plans have three phases, um, planning and training, threat assessment, and then activation. Right. And then as part of the plan, and we learned this from bird flu, actually, if you think back to bird flu, right, all the plans we were writing back then, we all were based on the WHO pandemic levels. And then what happened back then is if you think back to it, we reached the maximum WHO pandemic level and everyone was like, oh, my God, we have to activate all these plans. But then the disease wasn't very bad. And there was this whole big disconnect. So now when you're developing plans or brushing off your pandemic plans from from years ago, you need to take a look and, and design activation levels based on both the impact of the disease on your on your event or your company and the severity of the disease. And that's something that we learned from uh, pandemic planning. And then the second thing that we always recommend that you really should work on, and we've been working with some of our clients on this, is categorizing your employees. Coming up with a list of, of, of four categories, um, and some people use it, uh, five or six, and but I think four kind of covers everything. Um, the employees that have to perform really mission-critical, important, time-sensitive functions, and they have to be on site. And then category two are the folks that do the same thing but can work remotely. And then three are, are folks that do not perform mission critical stuff that can be postponed but have to be uh, – but can work remotely. And number four is they can't um, – they cannot work remotely but they can be postponed. Right. So you can take a look at this. Um, hopefully I haven't just confused everybody. But there are four basic categories. You should go through the exercise now of really – looking at your employees and figuring out which class of people, which class category do they fall into. It's a good exercise because it helps you think about and plan for what happens if we really have a community spread and we need to do social distancing and work from home. Now, one of the things that's very interesting that you need to think about with this particular illness is that the disease is affecting older people or people with um, underlying medical conditions much more than young, healthy people. So when you're looking at your workforce, you may want to think about changing the duties and taking the high-risk individuals, older people or people with underlying medical conditions, and keeping them away from the big crowds, like lower their, in their chance of becoming infected um, by maybe moving them into a back office position or something that's not right out there with the big crowds. So your ushers, for example, or your marshals, if you're at a race or something, take those people and put them in a less susceptible job, something that you should be thinking about as you go through your employee categorization. And then plan for employee absenteeism. You want to promote a culture where your employees stay home if they're actually sick, right? Because, you know, the old adage is I'm a great employee and I don't take sick days. Well, if you come into the office and infect your entire division and all your coworkers, you're not really being that good of an employee because you're going to take out a whole production team because you didn't want to take a day off. So you need to create that, especially with this particular disease um, that's spreading now, you want to create that culture where employees can take the day off or the couple days if they're sick, but then at the same time, create the ability for them to work at home as they're recovering. A couple other key components are making sure that there's flexible refund policies to keep sick people away from events, right? You don't want someone who says, gosh, I paid X dollars for this ticket and I am not going to miss that because I paid good money. Well, you may want to think about okay, we want to keep those people away from our event if they're really not feeling well. And one of the ways to incentivize that is to come up with flexible refund policies. Uh, policies. And then come up with an emergency action plan 
if in fact the event has to be canceled, right? And if if is the or postponed, who do you have to activate? Who do you need to tell? Is it the law enforcement people? Is it the venue people? Are there local um, media outlets? Who, what, who do you need to tell if in fact your event is canceled or postponed? And is there a way that your event could be enjoyed some other way? Can you live stream? Can you do what the Tokyo Marathon did, which is only run the elites? Um, they, they cut out the general running part of that race, but they ran the elites and they live streamed it and they used that still to, to run part of the race. Right? Can, you, can people enjoy this over television, radio, or, or perhaps live streaming? Some of our lawyers and insurance folks always remind me to say things to make sure you look at your force majeure clauses and vendor contracts and cancellation insurance as well. So that's number one. Number two on the eight things list is communicate with your key stakeholders. Make sure that you have developed holding statements, statements in advance on what you're planning on saying. Now, people, a lot of people say, Dr. Weiss, I don't want to scare people. I don't want to put bad thoughts in people's minds. Let me tell you, there's been a gazillion studies on this. You are not putting thoughts into people's minds. There is nothing that they haven't already read in the newspaper or heard on television or read on their social media that you could say that's going to make them more concerned or not concerned than they already are. So having holding statements actually um, and putting them out on a regular basis instills confidence in people that you are taking the right action. And then you should look at how are you handling social distancing, spectator safety, infectious disease concerns. And you want to make sure, as I said, you promote messages that discourage sick people from coming to your events. Here's a sample holding statement um, that when you look at the slides, and you, get, you can get a copy of the slides as well, sample that we've gone, that we've worked with some of our clients on, it basically says that we're monitoring the situation. Our top priority is the health and safety of our participants volunteers, staff, and spectators. Um, there's been no scheduling changes to our event, or you could change that to there have been scheduling changes. Um, we reiterate that we want staff who are feeling ill to stay home and participants who are not well to stay to not come to our event and that we'll provide updates as necessary. So sample holding statements, something that you could think about writing right now. Number three, Develop a process for situational awareness. How do you know what's actually going on? And we really recommend this, especially to large organizations. Come up with a specific department or person whose job it is to follow the news and follow what's going on and to verify the sources because information does not equal actionable intelligence, right? Just because you read it on the internet does not mean that it's true. So you don't want to act on things that have not been verified. Um, and there are a number of really good sources I've listed on this slide right now. The WHO puts out daily reports. The CDC puts out daily reports. The Johns Hopkins site. Your local health department may be putting it out. If you have a medical director, um, they're good. Or using us, for example, we put out reports for and, and daily updates for for some of our clients as well. So uh, making sure that you're collecting information from reliable sources is really important. And then that this person or this department should also track information coming from your internal business units, your supply chain people, the people that are doing prevent production, they should be talking to this person. And this person or unit or department will integrate all the information and put out a situation report um, on a fairly regular basis. And did it, there we go, the slide just changed, there we go. Okay, and as I said, you wanna make sure that you're checking tr social media stories very carefully because there's a lot of false stuff going around. Number four, check your supply chains and then check them again. We are already hearing from some of our clients that they are having problems with some of the items that they need, for example, our, some of our races are telling us that they were having trouble getting medals because they came from China. So you run a whole race and you finish and you don't get a medal. Some people will be very disappointed. Um, there are problems with some of the RFID chips that are used in race scoring systems for races or event access control systems. Or for those of you that are using cashless purchasing, 
with a, with a bracelet around somebody's um, wrist. Those kind of RFID chips, RFID chips are made in China, and there's been some issues with that as well. So map your supply chains, look upstream, look upstream a couple of levels. Does your supplier, where do they get what they need? And have they started talking about what happens if they can't get what they need? Um, for example, I was talking to one of the major race timing companies, and I asked them how much, if, if China was to cut off your supply of RFID chips, how much stock do you have here in the United States? And they had six months worth of stock, which would get us halfway through the summer, but would miss the whole fall season if there was a problem with RFID chips. So make sure you map your supply chain, talk to your critical vendors, make sure that they have, if they have vulnerabilities, what are they actually doing to address them? And we, we just talked about this, so we'll skip through that. There we go. Number five, promote good health habits, right? So there's some basic things. If you take a look at the way the virus spreads that you can do to actually reduce the chance that you're going to catch it, that your employees are going to catch it, right? So hand washing techniques, having good hand washing, which is washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Um, that's really important. And having hand washing stations and hand sanitizer stations at your events, especially around the food stations, is really important because people that have contaminated hands and then touch food and then eat it, they'll infect themselves. Now, just a quick word about the hand sanitizers. Um, as I wrote on the slide, you have to make sure that it's got at least 60% alcohol in it. Um, the really cheap ones that you can buy, the generic ones, sometimes have less alcohol in it. So less than 60%, they're not effective. And they only really work on clean hands. If your hands are all muddy or dirty, um, hand sanitizer does not actually work. You have to use soap and water. Covering your cough, here on this slide is a picture, it's a dark field picture of what a, actually a sneeze and respiratory droplets look like. So when you sneeze really vigorously, you shoot a cloud of, of uh, respiratory droplets about six feet out in front of you, which is why we social distance about six feet, right? So we want to make sure that um, you're sneezing into your elbow, not into your hand, because then you contaminate your hand. Stay home when you're sick. Um, avoid touching your face, as we talked about, um, and implementing, as I said, more hand washing and uh, hand washing stations and um, alcohol. The uh, it's interesting. We uh, we cover some cruise lines and we help them with some special issues that they have. And I just was covering a cruise, um, working on a cruise ship just about a month ago, and they really have this hand washing thing down. You cannot enter a dining room anywhere on these ships without passing a row of sinks or getting a squirt of hand sanitizer on your hands. So they are the friendliest hand sanitizer dispenser people I've ever met. They're smiling and they're saying happy, singing wash your hands song and being very happy about it, but they are making sure that everybody that comes that eats food has, uh, has cleaned their hands for various reasons, not related to coronavirus, but you know, for other viruses that spread in on the, uh, on chips. Then there's a couple other points about uh, good health habits. Um, implementing social distancing at staff between events, staff, and patrons. If you can increase the distance between people, that's good. That always helps. Making sure you stop if you're at a race. There's a big tradition at some races to high five or hug people at the finish line. That should stop. No shaking of hands at meetings. And increase the cleaning schedule. Um, at surf of surfaces in your in your event, because again, one of the ways of getting contaminated is by touching um, a surface that's contaminated. And the virus can last about three, four hours in the environment, and then it degrades. So um, you do need to clean reg regularly. Number six, and we're getting to the end here, and we'll, then we'll start for questions. Number six is make sure you have a risk assessment on company travel. This is very important in the early days of containment. A little less important now because we're going to start seeing community spread throughout the U.S. and most countries in the world. Um, but still, there's lots of companies that are actually um, still implementing restrictions on unnecessary travel. If you do travel, there's a couple of quickly interesting things I wanted to just tell you. Lots of studies on airplanes. Um, 
basically your risk for catching something is about six feet. The planes have fairly good HEPA filtration systems and they circulate the air and filter it. Um, but if somebody is coughing or sneezing, two rows ahead of you, two rows behind you, or within six feet right or left, you got to, in one study, you had about an 80% chance of catching whatever they have. Um, so if you can, if you happen to be lucky enough to have some masks, um, I always travel with two masks in a Ziploc bag. And if somebody is sneezing and coughing or hacking away, I try and get them to wear a mask. But if that doesn't work, then I put one on myself. And then I also have Clorox wipes and I wipe down my armrest, TV, and tray table. And that cuts down on getting sick on airplanes in general. Number seven, review the business continuity with infectious disease in, in outbreak in mind. So just think, how will you function if you have long-term significant staff reductions? Um, what do you actually do to, what's the, you have to do to produce an event, and what are the nice-to-haves? And can you actually recategorize what you're doing at your event and, and reduce the nice-to-haves and only do what you need to do to make your event to produce your event. How would you do social distancing um, if you had to at an event? Some events, it's very problematic. We were talking about that with a, with a client just two days ago. They have a big, really important high visibility VIP event. And we were trying to, to brainstorm how do they continue to have this event if, in fact, they need to worry about the spread of coronavirus. And we talked about, like, for example, HEPA filter machines. Um, that clean the air, these portable HEPA filter machines. We talked about real-time thermal imaging as you entered the door of the room so that we could sell, tell who's sick and who isn't, who has a fever and who doesn't. We talked about having hand sanitizers and, and um, at every place where there's food in the room because it's a, a big meeting and they were going to have food at the room as well. So there's lots of strategies that you can start thinking about, but you need to think about it from an infectious disease standpoint. And then can you can people work from home? Do you have enough infrastructure to allow folks to work from home? So we use, for example, Zoom as our um, online um, video conferencing and webinar service. Um, there's lots of them out there. We particularly use Zoom. I, I had a conversation with the, with the owner and founder of Zoom the other day, and I basically said to them, how can you can you handle if your real-time traffic doubled? And then what happens if it was 10 times? What happens if it was 20 times? Um, and I had a good, a good discussion about can Zoom handle the extra traffic if everybody starts working remotely? So you should be doing the same thing with your IT team um, or your third-party IT providers. And then also, does the person working from home have the office equipment that they need to do their job. If somebody's job is to scan items into a server somewhere and they don't have a scanner at home, then that makes it very hard for them to do their job. And lastly is inventorying the current personal protective equipment, PPE, that you currently have. Do you have adequate well, nobody has adequate masks because there aren't enough around in the world. But do you have gloves and hand sanitizer and cleaning supplies to keep your surfaces um, clean? And then who gets what types of uh, personal protective equipment? And then lastly, a little bit, just a few moments about personal and family preparedness, right? So what do you tell your, your family? One, avoid sick people. Remember we talked about you spread virus mostly when you have symptoms. If someone looks terrible and they look sick, stay at least six feet away from them. Make sure you wash your hands. Use hand sanitizers when you're in public places. Um, carry a mask if you can get one when you travel um, on an airplane or if you're taking care of somebody who is sick. Um, and just be smart about your, your health choices. One of the questions we often get um, is about dogs and cats. So I always like to mention that for a second. Um, one in the whole world, one case of a dog in China from a house where the person was in the hospital because they had a severe case of coronavirus, the dog tested positive weekly in their nose and throat. The dog had no symptoms, wasn't, had, didn't have a runny nose, wasn't coughing, nothing like that. But there's one case. So we're watching that. So right now, Fido and Fifi are just fine, but we are keeping an eye on that closely.
So we went through the eight things that you should be thinking about now. Now is the time to do the planning so that when the time comes that you have to make some decisions about your upcoming productions or events that you've already thought about it and you've developed a plan to handle things. Because if you're working with your public health officers and you have a good mitigation plan, you may be able to influence the decisions that they're making or at least educate them on the, on the fact that you're being proactive for your events. This could be, we could be in this for the long haul. This virus may continue through the summer. The virus may continue until the weather warms up and then slow down and come back after the summer's over. We don't know how this virus is going to act. We don't know. We know it's going to be a big pandemic because it probably already is. Um, it's met the definition of, of the three the three definition for the WHO pandemic status, but we don't know how ill people are going to get, and we don't know what the final mortality number is going to be. But just remember that a good, strong business continuity plan with a infectious disease slant, we're looking at your your continuity plan through the lens of infectious disease will help you get through this difficult time if events have to be canceled and productions can't go on. This is my contact information. I am at your disposal. Please feel free to send me an email if you have a question or a concern, if you want us to help you with your plans, whatever it is, let us know. We are very happy to help the event industry. I've been working in this field for years and years and years, and um, we would like to make sure that together we all survive this public health crisis as best we can. And um, with that, I can turn it back to you, Jake, and, and take any questions that we happen to have. Doc, hi, it's, it's Jim. I, I, wanna, I wanna jump in and see if I can summarize briefly and see if, I, see if I've got it correct from the information. Firstly, thank you so much for giving us your time and your insight on this. I'm sure that many of us found it extremely useful. But if I'm a person who needs to walk away and, and, and think about actionable steps from what I've just learned, I heard something similar to this. Firstly, I want to demonstrate for my staff at my venue or my staff at my vendor or, or, or just those who are a part of creating success around my orbit that I care about them. And I want to know that they are healthy and if they're not healthy, I want them to know that they have the okay for me to work from home or to take the time off because we'd rather they not get sicker at work and potentially spread that to those they work with. And we want them to take the time they need to get healthy at home. So number one, I want to know that my humans are doing everything they can to look after themselves, including you know, not putting themselves at unnecessary risk and exposure. Number two, I want to demonstrate that my venue or my, my workplace or that the services that I provide are doing everything I possibly can. They're doing everything they possibly can to minimize the potential that we are putting people, uh, our audiences at risk or our people at risk. Meaning, like in the theater, I'm demonstrating I've, I've kept a clean theater or I'm using thermal imaging on the audience as they come in and I found some tasteful way to say, I'm sorry, it looks like you might have a fever. Perhaps you might consider not being in the venue tonight. And, you know, I, I, I don't know how that, I don't know how you interpret that to, to someone who now you've spotted on a thermal imaging camera that they might be sick. Uh, and number four, I, I, well, and, and, and also in the case of mass gatherings, where is this, where is the line? How do we determine, you know, are we all at the mercy of the local authority, even though the World Health Organization or the CDC may be saying something different? And I'll, I'll hold there. Yes, so that's great. Um, and those are, those are exactly what I was hoping that you would actually learn. Um, yes, so the, the answer is if you're doing some type of proactive thermal imaging, um, and you do detect somebody with a fever, you would gently take them into, off into another play, a room that's out of the crowd and just ask them that, please, we notice that you're not feeling well and in the safety of everybody, we would ask you to leave. So in a nice, gentle way. And then you can, you can um, invoke whatever refund policies you have in place and whatever else you do for customer service. Um, as far as who gets to determine whether your event goes on or not, 
there will be guidance from the WHO. There will be non-binding guidance from the CDC, but the actual statutory in most locations across at least the United States that, and other places that we've actually worked, the ultimate authority is the local health department. So yes, in fact, you will be talking, you should be developing a strong relationship with your local health department now so that you can know that person and you can have a conversation with them about whether your event can go forward or not. Because they're the ones that have the ultimate, pub, under public health law, they have the ability to say, this is an unsafe act activity and we will not allow it. Jake, any any other questions? Okay, yep, or <laughs> I Jim? didn't know if that was under the line there, my friend. I've we have a couple of questions that came through, um, and I, before we get to those, I would like to say um, we've had a tremendous response of, of people sending through questions. Um, you, the email that uh, the Event Safety Alliance can be reached at is info at eventsafetyalliance.org, and I've been chatting with some of you via email here throughout the webinar. Uh, if you have questions, please send them over to me because I would like to compile this and they might be a future Q&A on the, the website. So please send those along. And, and on Jay, that note, we have- And Jake, any, any questions any questions that people send directly to me at um, sys.icrowd.com, we'll forward to you as well so you can put them in your FAQs. Fantastic, thank you, sir. Uh, got a question here at the bottom that says, you mentioned HEPA filters as a discussion point with a client. Are there a re are these a reasonable, wise option for those of us who perform in indoor venues? Vendors, right? Perform in indoor vendors, Venue. or venues, venues. venues. I'm okay, it, it's, I believe they've meant venues. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's a very it's a, it's a HEPA filter machines have a certain square footage that they can actually clean. So, depending on your space, you'd have to really match the size and quantity of HEPA filter machines. Um, that would to actually clean the the amount of volume of air in your space. So it's a little more complicated than just saying yes or no. It is definitely an option, but it depends on the size of your space. I know that in hospital settings, for example, we can create isolation rooms by using these portable HEPA filter machines. Um, so this particular client needed to have this meeting go on. Um, and they were not open to not having it go on. And so we, one of the options we talked about, we explored, let me just say we explored it, was how do you actually clean the air? And, and the HEPA filter machines are the way to do that. Excellent. Uh, we have another one here. It says, as an arts organization, all our events are public gatherings. Unless the city shuts us down, we plan to go on with our shows in March. Is there anything you can suggest to help reassure our audience? Yes. So the messaging is very, very important there. So I would actually message the, the audience that you are watching this very closely and that the health and safety of your of your patrons is, is utmost in, in, in your mind. I would make sure that there's signage at the entrance that says, please, if you're not feeling well, we would encourage you to please not attend today's, uh, today's performance. Make sure that you're cleaning adequately um, the surfaces make sure that you have hand sanitizers next to if you have any concession areas so that people can see that you're taking hand washing or hand clean, cleaning very very seriously and you may also want to have a sign that says if if we notice and you can figure out the best politically correct way to say this but if we notice that you are coughing and sneezing excessively we may ask you to leave so the idea is to actually do the, the public health interventions that reduce the ability to transmit the virus and also that gives the public the perception that you're actually taking this seriously and you're doing everything you can to keep them safe. Fantastic, thank you. And it looks like... Jake, so. let me ask you, let me answer one or two, I know it's after three, so just a couple, two questions that people have asked on, on previous presentations. One is... One of, the, one of their clients was talking about they get shipments from Chinese factories and are the products safe to touch and do they need to be cleaned? So if you're importing stuff and you notice that it comes from China or Pakistan or that part of the world where there's a lot of disease, um, remember the virus only lasts for a couple of hours in the environment. So those products are actually perfectly fine to touch, to use. You're not at any increased risk at all. And then uh, another common question we get um, is, can somebody catch the virus more than once? Um, 
so classically, if you catch the COVID, the virus that causes COVID-19, um, you can only catch it once. However, if, if the virus changes its genetic material, which viruses normally do, um, it could make it so that you could catch it more than once. But right now, theoretically, um, you should only be able to catch this virus um, once. So those are two common questions that we get asked. Other than that, I'm happy to answer any of the questions that people send to us. And uh, thank you once again for allowing me to present this. Well, thank you all very much for uh, uh, coming in today. And uh, thank you all for your patience. I will say that uh, we really did uh, stretch this uh, webinar platform to the limit today. So if you did happen to miss any of it, either due to uh, time constraints or technical issues, this will be available for streaming for quite a while. We will send you the link this afternoon. And thank you very much.